Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, we will take a minute or so and let uh, others join the Zoom. Um, happy Friday. And we, we're happy to be talking about ag housing in South County today. And we're excited to have you here. And uh, we're excited to be co-hosting this event. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. We'll just give everybody about another minute and then we'll get started. Um, and, uh, and we'll get into the, the ag housing situation in South County. Okay, I think, uh, I think we will get started. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself and Silicon Valley at home. My name is Rick Lasalvis. I work on housing production and policy issues in the Silicon Valley. And our mission at, at uh, Silicon Valley at Home is to make the Valley more affordable. So more housing, more affordable housing and more accessible housing throughout the Valley. Um, I did wanna to start today's event really with a moment of silence in light of the tragic events that happened this week uh, that affected our community. And so I ask that everyone just take a moment um, before we get started and uh, acknowledge that. Thank you for that. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'll just jump right into it. We're really excited about this uh, panel and this discussion. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, share with you many of the great things that Silicon Valley and its partners and members are doing for Affordable Housing Month. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, we had over 50 events for Affordable Housing Month this, this month, and we still have a few more. Um, please check out our website at siliconvalley.org, excuse me, siliconvalleyathome.org, and uh, consider membership because we do um, rely on membership to make housing possible, affordable housing possible in the Silicon Valley. And we really appreciate our partners, our members, and your support. So having you here is uh, of great value to everybody who's advancing uh, affordable housing causes. Um, with that, it gives me uh, a lot of pleasure to, to introduce Rebecca Garcia uh, with Morgan Hills Housing Department, who will be moderating the event, and I will uh, hand it over to Rebecca. Thank you very much, Rick. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay, Rick? Yes. Great. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. I'm Rebecca Garcia, the housing manager with the city of Morgan Hill. Our Morgan Hill team is incredibly grateful to have Silicon Valley at home as a year-round partner. As Rick mentioned, this month alone, they've hosted over 50 events for Affordable Housing Month in partnership with many cities in the county and community-based organizations to highlight the important work that we all do, raising public awareness on issues related to affordability for all of us, all of which are recorded on their website. I myself have learned a ton. Um, I highly recommend you take a look at their website when you have time. This event is also being recorded. Today, we're very excited to feature a wonderful panel of professionals that I know from various industries who touch the lives of our agricultural community one way or another. We've invited them here today to just share some of their thoughts and experience as we talk about how we move towards building and prioritizing agricultural housing for our workforce that is affordable and accessible to our ag community and the various different ways we can really work towards accomplishing that. Assembly member Robert Revis has been very, very active in this issue and has a personal story to share with you. He really wanted to be here today and sends his apologies for not being able to make it, but he did send us a video that we will share with you now. Hi, everyone. I really appreciate the invitation to be part of this panel today. I wish I could have participated, but unfortunately, the state assembly is in session this morning. But as our state continues to make progress against the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person very, very soon. Uh, and having just entered my third year in the California legislature, my second two-year term in the state assembly, uh, I can tell you uh, the past 15 months has been incredibly challenging uh, for our country uh, and for our state. Uh, no one no one could have predicted in March of 2020 how quickly this COVID-19 health crisis would transform our lives. 
uh, in the modern history of California. No state legislature, no governor, and no local government has faced a crisis like this one, unexpected, statewide, uh, affecting every Californian, uh, putting unprecedented strain on our healthcare system uh, and lasting now for well over a year. Uh, and make no mistake, uh, our pre-pandemic problems of housing availability and affordability, of increasing homelessness, uh, of addressing our climate crisis, uh, those problems, they still exist and have only been exacerbated and made worse. Uh, and as we all know, uh, California's statewide housing shortage or housing crisis has been decades in the making. Uh, and clearly there is no one solution uh, to solve our housing problems. Uh, historically, there are many factors that have contributed and continue to contribute uh, to our housing crisis. Factors that require a multi-policy approach to address. Uh, and I'm not a housing expert, uh, but the issue of housing is very personal to me. Uh, it's personal uh, because I grew up in crowded housing in a tract of farm worker housing units. Uh, and let me tell you that it was harder to get schoolwork done in that environment. It was harder to focus. Uh, and when my family was finally, finally able to move out of that tract of farm worker housing uh, and into our own home, uh, our lives improved considerably. Uh, it felt like we were grasping a rung on a ladder, uh, a ladder that would take our family out of poverty. Uh, and today, uh, I see so many people, so many farm working families uh, like my own, uh, who are not being given that opportunity. Uh, and despite the key role they play, uh, the challenges they face, the farm workers continue to be some of the lowest paid workers in the entire US labor market. Uh, and they're more likely to live in crowded, substandard homes, and be subjected to unhealthy living conditions. But addressing our farm worker housing problems is not easy. You know, farm and agriculture work has evolved over time. And for the most part, the industry has experienced a shift, uh, a shift away from a largely traditional migrant workforce toward a more year round or seasonal workforce where farm workers and their families have become settled into our communities. Uh, but California's agricultural industry is a diverse one. Its uh, workforce needs vary across our state. They differ from one region to the next, depending on the agricultural operation or the commodity being grown or produced. Uh, as a result, uh, addressing our farm worker housing crisis requires a strategic approach, a strategy or an approach uh, that will vary by location, by region and community. Uh, and that's why I appreciate all of your work. I appreciate the city of Morgan Hill, your engagement and interest in this topic working to solve this or any issue requires a clear understanding of the problem and then a willingness to do something about it uh, with the prevalence of crowded substandard and unaffordable farm worker housing conditions an increased investment in housing for farm and agricultural workers is long long overdue as we've all witnessed during this pandemic and during worsening wildfire events year after year safe dignified housing for farm workers is a critical critical component in our public health response to farm worker well-being and to the well-being of their families again making progress in providing our most vulnerable workforce with housing requires a multi-policy approach a multi-faceted investment from private as well as public sources and most importantly we must have a willingness at the local level to make a difference address this issue. We can't afford to do nothing. And again, I appreciate all you do and look forward to seeing all of you very soon. Thanks. Thank you, Assemblymember Robert Rivas here with us in spirit. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge every elected official and planning commissioner who's taken the time to join us this morning. Please type your names in the chat so I don't miss anyone. Um, thank you to Morgan Hill Council member, member, mem member Gino Borgioli, Morgan Hill Council member Yvonne Martinez Beltron, Gilroy City Council member Zach Hilton, Gilroy Council member Rebecca Armendariz, Morgan Hill Planning Commissioner Militia Kumar, Los Gatos Vice Mayor Rob Rennie, and Assembly member Robert Rivas' staff Amy McElroy. And a big thank you to my entire City of Morgan Hill team. For those of you who have joined us, please type your names in the chat. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to remind my panelists you have about four to five minutes. I'd first like to start by introducing David Cox. He's a very special man in South County. 
He's the executive director of St. Joseph's in Gilroy, one of our local agencies that has been around since 1981. Um, David has been with St. Joseph's Family Center for about 17 years and works with many local volunteers to serve our community and improve the quality of life for the most vulnerable people in our communities. David, I know you and your team have been hitting the ground fast and furious since COVID began 15 plus months ago. I'd love it if you could share with us what you see firsthand as some of the needs are in our South County community, and in particular, what you see among our agricultural workforce community. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a distinct honor and pleasure to be uh, part of this today. And I think these are absolutely, and Assembly Member Revis absolutely uh, said it perfectly, uh, there's a certain dignity and right that we have as citizens to have adequate, safe housing and uh, access to some of the critical elements of life, uh, including food and medical care. I, I also loved what he said about this is really uh, about our will. It, it's how much we want to make an impact and make a difference in the lives of, of our community. Uh, so it certainly addresses the agricultural worker community, the homeless community, veterans, uh, and the list goes on. But it has been a, a turbulent time. I mean, we have uh, in Santa Clara County, uh, a disparity of wealth that has created a housing market that is uh, not reachable by most people. And certainly uh, that includes the vast majority of the agricultural workers in our area. Uh, it is simply impossible. We have families doubling up, uh, tripling up in units, which again, creates its own uh, chaos. It creates its own issues. Uh, as assembly member Riva said, it's very hard to function uh, and to grow and to achieve independence uh, and self-sufficiency uh, when you are uh, in those types of conditions. So I think it is something that our community really needs to address. Uh, we're talking about the government, we're talking about community-based organizations, uh, we're talking about uh, private foundations and individuals collectively uh, deciding we need to do something about this. So um, yeah, I mean, we've just seen dramatic needs even prior to uh, you know the pandemic and it's just been amplified uh, you know, 300% uh, over the last 15 months. We are starting to see a little bit of a tick downward, which I think is a very good sign. Uh, but I don't think anyone has probably been more impacted than uh, the agricultural farm workers. Uh, and they are absolutely a critical component uh, to our community's well being. Thank you so much, David. And, you know, what comes to mind is future evictions that occur and what tidal waves we may see in the future that hits a lot of different vulnerable populations. Yeah, and, and again, some statistics that a lot of people have heard, but you know, there was a 30% spike in homelessness in Santa Clara County when the last census was completed. And there has been a dramatic increase uh, with leveraging resources and, and uh, Measure A dollars to create housing, mm -hmm. uh, but it is still not enough. This crisis is continuing to multiply in effect and create uh, at-risk situations for thousands and thousands of families in our community. And uh, I really like, again, the approach that, uh, you know, a lot of our local uh, housing partners have when they, when they talk about sustainability, accessibility, and what I always call what is truly affordable housing, mm -hmm. uh, because agricultural workers uh, roughly make about $25,000 a year. And uh, that's why they're having to triple up in order to meet the high rents and the cost of living here. So uh, mm -hmm. it's something we can't ignore. We really need to, to put this as a priority and address it as a community. David, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I'm going to go on to Mr. Michael Meehan. Um, Michael is with the Santa Clara County Planning and Development Department. He's one of the county's senior planning managers who's been leading efforts to increase opportunities for our ag workforce. Michael successfully led an effort to make it much easier to develop agricultural housing in the county, thank you, Michael, so that it's processed over the counter in a ministerial fashion. Um, share with us, please, what you've been working, at, working on at the county's planning department. Thank you, Rebecca, for inviting us to chat on this topic. I'll start by noting that in 2018, the county worked with the local ag community to conduct a needs analysis for unmet ag housing um, demand, which showed that there was a need for approximately 1,400 new units on a seasonal basis 
and uh, as many as 700 permanent new residences at that time. I'm sure that this need has only increased uh, over the last three years. Meanwhile, over the past decade, we've seen fewer than one new unit in the unincorporated county every two years. This has led to um, what you mentioned, our streamlining of the planning process to help alleviate the many costs and barriers to developing new ag housing. In October of 2020, the board adopted zoning ordinance amendments that effectively waive any discretionary review of such projects and now allow for up to six units per parcel through ministerial approval. Additionally, we created two new categories that are a bit more experimental, allowing movable tiny homes for up to five years on one location or on an ongoing seasonal basis. Now, we believe these, uh, these changes help a lot and we're seeing a significant amount of new interest to develop ag housing just in the last couple months. However, virtually all of unincorporated county lands have some significant site constraints, whether it's wildfire risk, slope and grading limitations in the ranch lands and the hillsides, or the very high groundwater table on the valley floor and difficult uh, establishing septic systems. I'm working with one applicant right now who started with plans for four units and is now down to only two units because septic design limitations uh, were so tricky and costly, again, due to the really high water table. So what this means is that we really must see increased efforts in collaboration between jurisdictions and from our cities to accommodate our agricultural workforce without the benefit of urban services and amenities. Uh, the need for the some 2,100 new units, if not more, isn't gonna be met in unincorporated rural areas alone. Another issue I'll just flag maybe for discussion later, but something that we're seeing to be increasingly challenging uh, that we're not able to overcome is the difficulty of establishing new large scale water systems in the rural areas. The state given uh, a pattern of failing water systems in other parts of the state um, is not inclined to approve these new, these new systems and wants connections to, um, to urban service areas. And so that's another obstacle that we're facing. We're still gonna do everything we can to get as many property owners as possible to develop on that small scale side. And that's where we see the largest demand, one unit, two units, three units, four units uh, per parcel. Um, but we really have to work together on these larger scale projects uh, and particularly in urban areas in order to meet that need. Thank you so much, Michael. This is hard work, right? There's, we try to do it and there's always a challenge that comes up, but I appreciate your work on this and every single unit counts. Um, can you talk a little bit about the tiny or the tiny homes or the mobile homes that you mentioned? What's the opportunity there? Yeah, so there's, there's two different options. One is um, essentially a, as a, a caretaker for a property or in the absence of a permanent residence on site, perhaps as a precursor to a permanent residence on site, up to five years, you can have a temporary, um, what we call a temporary ag residence. And that's a, a travel trailer, a movable tiny home, recreational vehicle um, that's allowed on site. Again, the limitation is septic. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we, there's no way to allow those, those um, housing units to be established without a connection to a septic system. So unless you're planning on building a home or a number of homes on that property in the future, and you already developed a septic system and the, the temporary ag residence, the movable tiny home is an intermediary, it's still pretty cost prohibitive to do that. You can't just roll a unit out on uh, the farmland. The other option is on a seasonal basis where you have permanent pads set up and um, movable tiny homes could be brought on site for up to 180 days per year. And there are a lot of state uh, laws and limitations that we had to work around, but we're hopeful that, uh, that some uh, farm workers and their employers will be able to take advantage of these more novel approaches. Awesome. This is great. Michael, will you do me a favor and type in the chat where folks can access more information about this on the county's website? Yeah, well, we don't we don't actually have the, the, oh, okay. the handouts yet, but um, I can put my email address in there and um, we're finalizing those FAQs and handouts right now. And so I'm awesome. happy to put people on a list and reach out when that's complete. 
cutting edge. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we are going to move on to Miss Helena Roberts. It is my pleasure to introduce our Deputy Agricultural Commissioner of the Santa Clara County Division of Agriculture. Helena is going to share with us some data and facts about the ag industry in Santa Clara County and in South County that are helpful for us to keep in mind as we continue to try to move the needle on this issue. And just bear with us a couple seconds. Here we go. Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, my presentation basically is going to be some data that reflects the reality of the ag industry in our county. Just to give an overview how important it is to keep this industry running and the workforce uh, as well. Uh, well. I'm going to present the um, economic report that was published by the Ag Commissioner's Office to quantify the economic contribution by the ag industry in our county. And also I will be using some data from the farm worker housing study plan that was published uh, by the Salinas Valley and Pajaro Valley. And um, also um, this study represents what we have in our county as well, uh, what is the characteristics of the uh, field worker uh, in this area that we share a lot of commonalities. As well, I'm going to share what I have been hearing directly from our growers and our field workers in my daily uh, work, uh, that in routine conversations I'm going to um, share. So if we can move to the next slide. This is what, uh, how much important is our agriculture. So we have a contribution of a total of 830 million annually to the Santa Clara County economy. We, the ag industry, employ more than 8,100 workers annually. And we have over a thousand farms in our Santa Clara County and on an average of 2,200, uh, 225 acreage. And, but we have to take the consideration that 51% of those parcels are less than 100 acres. Those are small, small farms. This industry also uh, provide uh, opportunities for skilled and unskilled workers that in, in other um, aspects, they are not able to, to work in, in other in industries. The industry is also growing in productivity per unit worker and per unit land. Even the ag land is decreasing because all the development, but the increase in productivity is representing more in value and um, is increasing with all the access to new technologies, is increasing productivity, and we are really uh, uh, pioneers in uh, adopting new technologies. Very important to um, note that the contribution of the value of Santa Clara County on natural capital that exceeds, 40, exceeds 45 billion. Agriculture preserves some of these vital natural process and adds to the character of the county. Without that, our county will be only cement and industry that don't add beauty to uh, the, the surroundings. And uh, agriculture can be viewed as self-financing open space, providing important ecosystem service values to county residents. If we can move uh, at less than 10 acres, uh, 10 acres. Is, that was a question on there. Is 51 per parcels are less than 10 acres. Can move to the next slide, please. This study was developed um, by the Pajaro Valley Farm Worker Study that was initiated back in 2016, and I think they completed in 2018. It was very comprehensive study um, to verify how was the field workers' uh, condition and some little background of this community. 
So um, they estimated that about 90,000 farm workers live in the region, uh, earning an average of 25,000 a year with the high cost of affordable places in Santa Clara County is no wonder why we have so many problems of overcrowding and uh, it's not accessible really. Uh, earning $25,000 a year is not going to give them a, a place that they can call home and be suitable for them. We have also the migrant field workers um, or the H2A visa field workers that usually when they come to our area, they share motels. The um, contractors uh, usually uh, rent these places. Sometimes there are four people or more per room. Domestic field workers, uh, on the other hand, live with their families in houses or apartments but um, sometimes two, three, four families per, per uh, location. And um, of course they are trying to leave, uh, keep their costs low. And um, sometimes we have just one family per room. And I see that firsthand since I live in Salinas and um, I see that um, all the time how the density, the community live in overcrowded conditions. And uh, the McKinney Vento Act, uh, it shows that overcrowding has resulted in one of the highest population in the state of children considered homeless. And with the COVID-19, um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody um, uh, was watching the data and that Salinas, for example, was on one of the uh, highest places with highest uh, rate of inspection and it's because this overcrowd condition is very hard to keep people healthy living in that type of environment. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what we see now, so of course the increased uh, cost, this is for the growers because sometimes uh, the, the field workers or the contractors grow, go for the highest bid. And it's a constant competition between them to get people working in the fields that can cause uh, crop losses due to delays in agricultural practice practices uh, like pruning, weeding, etc., and uh, doing harvest, if the grower is not able to hire on time, they are going to uh, lose some uh, or sometimes uh, a lot of their uh, production. Mm, we see, on the other hand, that um, people are trying or the growers are trying to um, modify their, the crops that they are growing and they are, uh, have the tendency now to start thinking about how they can mechanically um, harvest uh, their crops. So there is a transition there, some movement. We see also some uncertainty. So how the new generations don't really want to remain on the family farm. Many uh, farms are getting uh, sold and uh, really this, this is not going to continue. And uh, we really want to keep uh, our uh, safe uh, security in terms of feeding uh, the people from our county with local resources. And we see also the ag land transitioning, transitioning to urban, which is we are losing a lot of acreage uh, now due to new developments. Next slide. So what what they the uh, the ag field workers uh, need really they want stability. They need uh, to be able to live in the county where they uh, work. They need affordability. Um, we need to be able, and, and thanks uh, Michael Meehan for uh, working really close on this uh, issue. That is very important. They are able to afford the places that they consider a home and they are close to uh, the places where they go um, to, to work on the daily basis. 
So for domestic workers, what they need is adequate housing to raise healthy families, near schools, transportation, and other necessary services. And for migrant workers uh, in good condition, um, housing in good condition and easy access to service as well. I think that's my final uh, slide, but I can't emphasize the need of uh, a solution for this crisis um, because we all need to have our full resources. We need more sec secure food system. We need to support the people who work on the industry. And um, we need, this is uh, uh, require a lot of forces united to help to um, provide solutions for this. Helena Roberts, thank you so much for joining us. All of these points are taken, thank you. I'm going to now introduce Mr. John Bigley. It is my pleasure in, to introduce John, who I've worked with for the past six years as UHC Urban Housing Communities has built affordable housing in Morgan Hill. UHC is a family-owned mission-driven company dedicated to developing affordability, sustainability. Um, John is the chief operating officer. He's also a part of the reason why we are very close to meeting our housing goals here in Morgan Hill. He has helped us build projects successfully. John is gonna share with us a little about his experience with farm worker housing from a developer's perspective. And very excited, a farm worker housing project that we're working on now and very excited about here in Morgan Hill. John, I will turn it over to you and ask that you share with us any challenges or opportunities that come to mind from a developer's perspective and a little about the project. I heard you for a second. How about now? How, yep, sure can. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so again, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here and, and uh, sharing our experience with, with everyone today. And I kind of had an idea what I was going to talk about, but then hearing Assembly Member uh, Robert Rebus talk and Helena just speak, um, it changed a little bit. But what I thought I would do is talk first a little bit about um, our philosophies which, you know, we develop low-income housing. We do your typical low-income housing. We do farm worker housing. We do uh, veteran housing. We do some supportive housing. Um, when you're um, trying to meet the needs of the very low-income households, um, a lot of it is very similar in that what families need and what kids need which Helena pointed out is, and, and there's something that Robert Rebus pointed out, is good quality, affordable housing in low crowded um, conditions so that you can excel in school, you can excel in job training and other aptitudes that you might have. And, you know, it doesn't matter. Our philosophy coming in was if, you have the best school across the street from you, but if you're living with, you know, 12 other family members in a one bedroom place, or you're having to sit on the floor because, you know, there's gunshots over your head, you're not gonna be successful. So we have to change the dynamic and provide quality, safe, affordable housing where, which will allow people to truly meet their um, abilities. But on top of that, we find that, um, especially in the uh, farm worker community, a lot of families are kind of stuck in a cycle where because they're so low income, kids at a very young age have to start working. And then even when they go to school and they graduate from high school, they, they don't even think about college or thinking of or think about anything else, but I've got to go work because I got to support the family. So it's hard to sometimes break that cycle. Now, if you want to be in the agricultural business and that's what you love to do, then great. But if you don't, uh, it's nice to be able to provide avenues for uh, the children to let them know that there are opportunities available to them. 
So with that as my backdrop, we've developed two affordable housing communities, uh, one in uh, the city of Madeira, which is a typical family uh, permanent farm worker uh, housing. Uh, it's a 64 unit uh, garden style apartment development. Then the one out in India, which is the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs area, that one is an 80 unit with half of the units being designated to farm workers. And it's actually senior farm workers. So people that have, um, you know, some of them unfortunately are still working um, and some of them who have retired from the farm worker uh, business uh, reside there. So we've done both those two. Um, they've actually, been very good um, communities for us. The only thing I will say that we learned is <laughs> we thought we were doing the right thing. We had a really nice carpeting in the Madeira one and then realized just given the nature of the work, carpeting was not a good uh, a good move because you know it wore out very quickly, it got dirty very quickly. Plus you have health issues with that. Um, so we've, we've learned from that, but, but generally, uh, very good communities. And we, we try and build the same for the farm workers. And we do permanent farm worker housing. We don't do migrant farm worker or um, temporary farm worker housing. We do the permanent. So we're trying to find locations that are within a relatively decent proximity to where their work is. But also, as Elena had pointed out, you know, they're close into transportation grocery stores, drug stores, parks, stuff of that nature. And we wanna make sure that, you know, whether you're a farm worker or whether you're low income, or as you can see on the screen here, we try to build to market rate quality as standards because that's what's going to change people's um, perceptions of their themselves. They're, it's gonna put them in a much better emotional place to really want to take advantage of services and programs that we can offer to help show them that there's other opportunities uh, if you would like to pursue, if you'd like to pursue higher education, you know, how do you do that? How do you go about it? You know, I was very fortunate. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my dad instilled in, in myself and my brothers, you guys are going to college. And so we growing up, I just thought that's what you did. I thought everybody did that. And we were very fortunate just to have that belief structure. Unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, farm workers that don't have that. And their belief structure is, you know, I'm going to go into the farm worker. You know, I'm going to be a, a farm worker uh, because that's, you know, what their parents did. They, uh, you know, we all a lot of times follow our parents. So we try and helpfully create an environment is what we're trying to do is to make them successful as possible and follow their passion. And um, so with that being said, this is a 73 unit uh, development that we're proposing in the south end of Morgan Hill, which is on Monterey, southwest corner of Monterey and Watsonville. Um, right now we're thinking between 28 and 32 units would be farm worker housing and the rest would be a mix of uh, low income, anywhere from 40% to 80% for the other, uh, 36 to 40 units. Um, I like to point out the birds in the right corner. We always start with the birds because they're, they're an important part of the environment. I'm just joking there. Um, it's a three-story walk up. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, there we have the community center. That's where we'll have programs. That's where the manager will be on site. We'll have a uh, service provider on site, uh, maintenance, laundry facilities. Um, next slide. And that's just the overall layout of the facility. And that community center that you saw there is on the left side. When you come in uh, through the entrance, the community center is on the left. And then behind that, we have a, an open area. We'll have like a jungle gym and, and stuff of that nature for the kids. We try and do laundry facilities right next to that. That way, um, it's kind of a nice area for people to get together and congregate while they're doing you know their, their laundry the kids can be out playing and they can also interact with their kids um, at that same time but we try and and build a uh, market rate development that fits the needs in which we can 
overlay services that will help them get to the next level and and um, hopefully, you know, for lack of a better term, follow their dreams. Um, but this type of uh, development or community will really help provide the foundation for them to reach the next level in, in our minds. So that's kind of summarizes what I had to talk about. Thank you so much, John. You know, you and I have been talking about this project for quite some time, and I'm super excited about it. Um, I also want to thank you for talking about the fact that housing really is a well point in all of our lives, and the direct correlation to educational outcomes for children um, is huge. So, you know, I appreciate you as a developer recognizing that and having programs within each of your communities to work towards supporting those children. So thank you. Um, Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Consuelo Hernandez. Consuelo is the director of the Office of Supportive Housing with Santa Clara County. I've been very fortunate to work with Consuelo as well on several affordable projects over the years, and the county's incredibly lucky to have her. She's leading their affordable housing efforts, working towards ending homelessness, and what I will call the Herculean task of working with all 15 cities in the county to implement Measure A dollars including us. Um, Consuelo and I both have family that grew up in substandard working uh, farm worker housing conditions. And so for both of us, this is also very near and dear to our hearts. And so Consuelo, thank you for being here with us this morning and helping me keep this at the forefront of people's minds. Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning, everybody. Consuelo Hernandez, Director, Office of Supportive Housing. Um, As Rebecca mentioned, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, And my framing for this body of work is around, um, you know, the people that put food on our tables deserve a safe place to live. Um, And I think there are a number of challenges with that. A a few years ago, I had the pleasure of working with some of the farmers um, in South, um, South, in the South part of the county where I, I really learned some of the challenges with the cost of living here and the impact it has on Uh, the workforce, the employers, and ultimately how that comes to us in in the way of food. And where I think the opportunity is, um, for those of you that are not aware, the 2016 Measure A Affordable Housing Bond includes $150 million for workforce housing. And, you know, we in our office look at workforce, workforce housing maybe a little differently than others look at it, we look at it from the bottom to to 120% AMI. So one of the things that we're really excited about is um, John Bigsley's project. Thank you, John, for submitting that proposal to us this week um, and finding a way that we can fund that development through Measure A, but looking at it through the lens of workforce housing. Because again, um, what we are talking about are people who are working in our community that have a different need. Um, Earlier this Um, month, we also held a workshop in Spanish, um, Affordable Housing 101. One of the outcomes that we found in our outreach strategies in South County is uh, a lot of the people that we are trying to serve in affordable housing don't understand how to get into affordable housing. Um, And so there is this question of, in terms of challenges, the undocumented population that we work with and this um, perception that they are unable to live um, in affordable housing and demystifying all of that. So we've started to engage people um, in in the language that they speak. Uh, We've started with Spanish, as as Rebecca mentioned, this is something that is near and dear to our heart, Um, but eventually if we can get the right information, then we wanna offer it in different languages. And the idea is, You know, we sit behind a desk, put these projects together, go out and talk to the community and and, and tell them what we want or what we think, um, but don't spend enough time listening. Um, I I very much appreciated David Cox's comments earlier about the fact that Measure A does fill in a gap, but it doesn't fill in the complete gap. Um, And unless we as a community come together to build more housing that is extremely low income, we will never... Um, end homelessness. We will continue to see an inflow of people. Pre-pandemic, we were seeing um, that for every person we helped, three new people became homeless or were entering the system. And that's families, singles, whether they are, it's a short-term um, episode of homelessness, the fact that they even are at a place where they can't afford to live here and now are living in their cars is is an opportunity for us to really think about what we as a community want to do in the way of housing. 
Um, so there are a number of challenges, but the opportunity is there. I think we have a great panel from land use, policy, the employer side, and how do we work together to come up with a strategy? Um, I think Rebecca and I have been talking about this. God, Becky, I think it seems since I met you, <laughs> six since years ago, you in 2015, um, <laughs> that we've been talking about this opportunity. And my grandfather was a bracero. He came to this country um, to work, and then he would go back and, you know, back to his, his um, country. And um, he he has his farm in Mexico, and and I bring all of that here. And so I think really where the opportunity is, how do we come up with a strategy? In the same way that we've come up with strategies in our office, we have a supportive housing system that links individuals to critical services. What are the critical services here? John mentioned a number of items about wealth building, education, you know, and how do we, how do we break that cycle of poverty through housing and education? Um, because we've met a number of people who by default, they become, um, ag workers because that's their family, right? The, their family is in that business and they don't become the superintendents. They don't become the owners of the farms. Um, they continue to be the, um, the individuals who are actually doing the hard labor. Um, and my father said to me at a very young age, um, you should work hard and work smart. Um, not like me where I've had to um, pretty much use my physical strength and body to earn income. Um, and, and that's the spirit, I think, in everything that in the work that we do in our office is really uh, client-centered and developing programs and opportunities that focus on that. Um, and I realize that uh, all of that sounds very idealistic. Um, there is policy, there is framework, there, there's the technical experience, but, but from my perspective, if you don't bring that heart, um, there's no motivation or there's no, um, there's a lack of urgency um, and we feel it. I've heard stories from, from the ag community talking about being unable to, um, and I think we have another speaker who is going to talk more about this, but this lack of understanding in the northern parts of the county of the challenges that we face um, in, in the ag world. The, the other opportunities I think are at the state level. We have the Joe Cerna grant um, that does provide support to um, multifamily development, but it also offers an opportunity to fund single family homes that are dedicated to ag workers. And there are a number of restrictions with the funding. Most developers don't wanna to touch the money, um, but it would be good to understand why they don't. And then is there an opportunity for us to change policy through lobbying, through legislative act? actions um, and just better understand why people are not um, accessing those dollars because it could bring as much as $10 million into any development. Um, and if the concern is the seasonal aspect of income, how do you, how do you fix that? How do you, again, um, change the policies, talk to the public um, and put together a program that actually makes sense? Um, and Rebecca and I have not, not gone as far as coming up with a strategy, but I think if we can work together to come up with some goals, mm -hmm. that that will definitely, um, you know, take us into the right direction. So, and happy to take more questions. Thank you, Consuelo. Today is step one. And when the day comes where we um, do a groundbreaking for the first unit, I think we will both take a photo and send it to our tias and tios, and they'll be very proud. So... Um, thank you so much. We will definitely get to questions in just a minute. Um, lastly, it is my pleasure to introduce Tim Kiala with Kiala Farms. Tim is the Chief Operations Officer of this long-standing farm in our community that has been with us for about 43 years. I believe Tim's father, George Kiala, actually started farming in 1973. I'm sure they've seen a lot of changes and really faced a lot of challenges over the years. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. This is your work. The ag industry is your world. Please share with us your thoughts, changes you've seen over the years, challenges you've faced, opportunities. Um, what? How can we help support you and, and what can we do to continue to move the needle on this issue? Tim is probably- Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, no, that's okay. Well, I can hear you well. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, yeah, so 
first I wanted to kind of like uh, just kind of talk about um, the two different kind of ag labor we have going on right now because I think they're kind of all jumbled together. Um, so first of all, uh, Elena uh, mentioned the H2A worker, which is typically our seasonal worker that comes in. Uh, that's most of your field labor, and that's a larger number. Now, part of the H2A program is you have to provide housing, transportation, and meals as part of your part of that uh, migrant worker program. So that is why well, when she brought up the motel and stuff like that, I think the ag community should be applauded for that because um, the cities, the counties, they're unable to provide the houses that are need for these people. And they're not willing, no community wants to build a 150 unit dorm for people that are gonna live there for six months and, and then go away. So ag had to be creative and we took a lot of these rundown motels and it makes it sound bad, but it's not. They, they renovated these motels under strict standards and, and brought these, these places back to life. And their use for our own work and, <clears throat> And then for the employees and they're the employees come in, they come in, they're, they're great employees. They're here to work. Um, they have strict guidelines on their employment as well as um, they have certain responsibilities they have to maintain. And then they go back to where, uh, you know, Mexico typically. And, and they, it's the best foreign aid that any country can provide is giving someone that wants to work an opportunity to work, pay them at fair wages, better than fair wages. I and mean, we're, you're over $20 and 50 cents an hour after burden and everything else. So um, taking that money, giving us the resources to have people because there's just a labor shortage in general, and then send all that money back to there. They can spend it on their families and in their country, hopefully boosting up their economy. So that's the first type of work. And that's probably the one that most people associate with ag worker housing. And the truth is, it's mostly run through H2A now through the government. And when I was growing up, it was a lot different. All the farms kind of had their own little labor camps and the, 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 it would be the same people every year would come in, work and they would leave. Now that's a little different. We're using the government programs to kind of mitigate the lack of uh, employees coming across or even wanting to apply uh, for jobs. Now, the second one is ag what you guys are calling ag workers, I just call them employees that work in ag, um, which would be our permanent um, employees. Um, so they're no different than construction workers, restaurant workers, any type of minimum wage. And we have to compete with all those people. So the wages are, we're at 1650 as our minimum wage at this point, just to compete with everything else, just to get people to come through the door. So that's, that's what I think part of the community is talking about versus the the larger temporary units so those are as michael knows he's been working with us closely a lot of us have some of these older housing that we'd like to upgrade but you the cost of upgrading these units and then the restrictions put on to you by the the, the septic systems fire systems new building codes um i mean it's stricter it's stricter on these houses than it is on if you wanted to Put it on your mansion right it's insane so there's no incentive for us to and then we have to be charged 400 dollars a month right to keep it affordable so it's really difficult to mitigate these kind of when you want to do the right thing um but then they say yeah you can do the right thing but here's you know invest two million dollars and get 400 dollars a month per unit on 10 units so you're like okay well that's a great that's not my job, you know, that's not my thing. So I appreciate you guys all being on here and, and thinking for solutions, but I mean, it's a general solution. It's a, the, the permanent families that work in all of our industries that, uh, you know, build the houses, um, you know, that work in our processing plants that, uh, you know, are the, the, the lower income, they all need help. So um, I appreciate giving extra support to add. We, we definitely like it, but, um, you know, all my employees, um, we try to uh, funnel them into whatever programs we, we can to help them out. Um, another thing, most of our H2A workers, they have to come from the Valley because that's where the, 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 it's, 
less restrictive to build these sites. They're doing it. So Madeira, um, Los Banos, um, as far as far as south as uh, I mean, all that's where most of the the H2A workers are driving every day, just to get to Santa Clara County. So um, that's kind of where I am. So and yes, my dad started the farm in 1973, but my grandpa, um, long way from Italy all the way down, started in uh, in Santa Clara Valley in 1955. So oh wow, so I'm technically a third generation farmer in Santa Clara Valley, but. Um, anyway, so th- I don't really prepare something. I'm more on the phone to learn and see what opportunities are out there and, and yeah. try to make sure that people understand that, um, you know, an ag career in ag is not the worst thing in the world. I mean, um, very few of the guys that are, uh, that worked for us for a long time, their kids are in ag. A lot of, most of them have college educations. Most of them have gone on the secondary, uh, either trade schools, military careers, outside of us we would love to have them back but i employ everyone from the guy um you know picking the jalapenos to um electrical engineers that are designing um you know massive uh uh refrigeration systems so mm-hmm. that's uh thank you so, so yeah, much for sharing and or whatever. I... I didn't really prepare anything. that's okay i appreciate you sharing your experience um and i do think it's important for us to be reminded that there's two different types of workers that we're thinking about housing opportunities for both permanent and temporary. So thank you very much. I hope that you all continue to farm and, and we figure out ways to help support you in that. So with that said, I think we will, oh, I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge council member John McKay, who I see has joined us. Thank you so much. Um, and we are going to um, turn it over to questions. Rick is going to help me moderate this part. Hold on one second. And we will start with Mr. John Horner. Morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, here in my current role as a trustee with Morgan Hill Unified, but also as a longtime community member and active on a lot of different issues. And I, I put a question in the chat, and I, I hope we will get to that. And that's do we have the will and interest to have a plan to actually solve these problems? I've been going to meetings like this for over a decade. Some of you have been doing it for more. And we often talk about the why we should care and the conversation and the intention and all that. So we get to the why, but we don't spend enough time on the, on the what and the how. So, you know, are we just going to kind of talk about how bad we feel about these issues or are we really committed to solving them. And 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 I think it was Michael kind of responded to my thing and Jesse, well, you know, we need a, a, a true regional plan. It seems like the county is the entity that should be pulling that together. I, like many, voted for and supported the billion dollar bond issue, which I recognize isn't enough. But still, I, I feel like we keep throwing, um, you know, teacups at oceans. That That's my sense. If I'm wrong, I would love to be wrong about that. But but I don't think we are. And I think also, you know, to many of Tim Kiala's points, we have to acknowledge that the problems we have are not accidents. They're not just the vagaries of history. Every problem we have is a consequence of decisions we collectively have made. And particularly, I think of the you know, we, we like to talk about how we want, you know, safe, great housing for everyone. So there's another rule and another requirement and another rule and another requirement. Um, you know, at our at our home, we're about we're working on putting an ADU in place because the state told the county, you have to let us. That's the only reason we're going to be able to build something for our daughter to be able to not have to leave the area with her family. So, you know, for all of you that are in government here, please recognize government is part of what has created this. And we and we love to celebrate a building about, well, you know, we built 10 units here or 100 units there. But the question is, how do we get to scale? And how do we get a little bit less self-righteous about what kind of housing should be? You know, say, okay, I wanna have an RV park for people that are only gonna be here six months. Good luck getting that approved, right? Because it doesn't meet standards. Or as, as, as Tim said, you know, I want to renovate, you know, this farm worker housing that's been on my land for 60 years, 
that was built for, you know, a few hundred dollars a unit back then, but now it's like, oh, $2 million. So, you know, for, for our, you know, county and city people, what is the plan? And are you willing to accept that government and the citizens that drive government, including myself and our love of open space are, are part of the problem? So how do we really solve this and not just talk about how bad we feel? Thank you, Mr. Horner. Um, I think I'll take a first response at it. I, I do think you're absolutely right. Um, the challenge is huge. And you've heard a lot about the barriers that the realistic bar barriers that we face, especially in the county and with water tables. And um, But I will say, I think you have some folks on here who are interested in seeing units built and are committed to make that happen. I think our entire panel is. I hope that we'll be breaking ground on farm worker housing or agricultural housing units in the near future with John Bigley and the UHC team. Um, but I agree a thousand percent we need to figure out how to arrive at a place where we're to scale to what the need is. Um, and no, do not have the answer today, um, but Consuelo and I are committed to thinking this through and you know, for if we have all of your emails and, and we will definitely keep you in touch and invite you to further conversations. With that next, I would like to call on Council Member John McKay. Sure. John, were you done? Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, I'm sorry I'm late. I have a little bit of a registration hang up, but I'm, I'm just really tickled to see everybody here. I'm sorry I missed the beginning, so if I ask questions that have already been answered, yeah, just tell me to shut up. Um, first of all, um, you know, piggyback, piggybacking partially on what John uh, Horner just said, um, I work with ag community. I, I, you know, I go to the Farm Bureau meetings. Uh, Mike Meehan, uh, last year, I think you started sending me some information on this ag housing program. And I was really excited because I've actually had talk, uh, you know, had talks with private um, community members that were interested in introducing some form of farm worker housing um, within a development that they were working on. The problem was um, it, it was too restrictive. And so there is actually a will out there among some to do this. Why do we make it too restrictive now? And so um, I heard what Tim said. It's harder to build farm worker housing than it is to build a, a regular dwelling for, for one of us that we might consider living in. Um, I don't know if that's because it's a multifamily use, considered to be a multifamily use where they have different uh, you know, re uh, regulations requirements, but Tim, I would like to hear what what would what would help you, you know what what's what's the first impediment that really you know gets to you, um, and and I know that then all of a sudden it cascades ends up with a big dollar number that just is daunting. But how do we break down some of the issues that are impacting what you want? What's what are the unreasonable things that I that you, I'm sure you've got a list. I talk to farmers all the time. There's a long list of we shouldn't have to have this much water storage. We shouldn't have to do this. So, Tim. Could you start with telling me some of the stuff that we could do better? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, I mean, if you want farmers to complain, to complain, we can do that all day. That's what we do. But um, no, as far as specific, yeah, for specifically for ag housing, it always, it always, we have like uh, John mentioned that that housing was built by my grandparents in the fifties. Okay, so it's there. Um, you know, the septic systems are there. They, they're functional. They're hung up. They're not bad places to live, uh, but they needed to be upgraded. They're, they're, I think some of those houses were actually moved from Cupertino. My grandpa took him with him uh, from his ranch in Cupertino when he moved to Morgan Hill. But the, the craziest thing to me is why wouldn't the county just let us give us what we have? Just let us rebuild it. I mean, rebuild it either with prefab homes or, I mean, just upgrade it. So if you go in for a county permit, first of all, none of these things are zoned properly anyway. So they should have never been built in the first place, but it wasn't like that back then. There was, they just, you know, they said, hey, there was someone that needs a house. I have 10 workers, I'm gonna build 10 houses and their families can live there. And it's a benefit of working for Kiala Farms is you get to live here. Um, long hours, it's hard work. So there's gotta be some benefits. And that's why most of the, our older employees stayed because the, there's more than just a, a nominal per hour rate to it. There's a, there's a family aspect. There's a, we'll help them when they need it, that kind of stuff that goes on. And they become a part of your family, essentially. So the biggest thing is, like, why do we have to reinvent the wheel? And I, and I know 
it's pro- probably because of litigation that could happen down the road for whoever says yes to these kind of things. And the county's probably afraid of being sued by some organization that said you allowed substandard housing. But we would build it to code. We would build to everything else. But once you start pan peeling the onions of, of the county laws and regs, <clears throat> you, one, you can't get it done because no one will say yes. Two, it's your they take something that works and it's been there and they try to make it, you have to engineer it to the point where you can handle every extreme condition ever thought to man to do. So, I mean, I know there's no way around it. They have to do what they want to do, but it, it seems like if you have, there should be some understanding between people, government and the people making decisions that stamp the paper that says, Hey, these units are here. All he wants to do is upgrade them. So, and we want to keep the rent about the same for the people and, and be able to recover our costs over 10 years or something like that. You know, it's, it seems reasonable, but uh, they're not permitted. They're outside of the, 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 the cookie cutter approach. So mm-hmm. I guess the, the biggest challenge is every time we try to go in, we never really get past the first stage of this is not permitted to do in this property, even though it's already there. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of a ramble answer, John. I don't know if I answered your question correctly. No, but. in many ways you did. And, and I see Michael's got his hand up. I'd like to hear what Michael has to say, and then I'd like to actually make a, 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 a either kind of a question statement. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, the shorter answer is as of November 20th, 2020, you can now legalize those. It was, it was a zoning problem, and that zoning problem has been remedied through the zoning ordinance updates. It was not previously <clears throat> allowable to have more than a single family home in rural unincorporated county. And if those units are uh, to be used for agricultural housing, you can now have up to six units by right through a planning clearance over the counter ministerial permit. And that includes um, legalizing or updating existing residences or building new construction, or you can do some form of hybrid uh, group housing up to 18 beds under that same. You can go above that and you have to get a, a special permit, but those avenues haven't been available in the past. And as of this fall, they now are. That's, that's the short answer. I would say that there are a lot of, we pushed the envelope as far as we could in terms of alternative septic systems, alter, you know, we have serious barriers in terms of state regulations when it comes to what they call state water systems, small, state smalls and, and otherwise. And, and we're trying to think creatively about how to um, work around those. And there's still remain to be a barrier for some of the bigger projects in rural areas, which is why I think the higher density projects are, are often gonna be best suited when they can connect to water systems. But rural areas, again, up to six units, up to 18 beds, um, that's allowed over the counter now, and it never has been before. So hopefully, um, if you come in, Tim, or anybody else, we can have a more productive conversation now. Okay. Uh, and thank you for that, Michael. And I, re- I appreciate all your efforts. So when I saw what you were doing last year, it really it just really gave me hope that we could actually take care of some of these issues. What, I know that as a contractor and now also a person in government, what happens is um, there's a gotcha moment when somebody comes in for a permit. Oh, we got you. Now you got to fix everything on our list that maybe, you know, has otherwise kind of been grandfathered in and kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, okay. And so I don't want to think that our farm worker housing will be second class or third class or less class housing. I want it to be good housing, but maybe we should understand and appreciate that we could make it better than what it is. And sometimes excellence is the enemy of good. And maybe we can't go so far as to say, we, hey, thank you. Now that you come in the door, we got this list we want you to fix. Maybe we can be a little bit more lenient and understand that what we're going to do is not make it perfect and meet every single requirement. I mean, obviously, I think what Tim is saying is it all meets code. It's all safe. It's legal out from that perspective. But let's say... Um, we're not going to make you go out and do all these other things, you know, whatever they are, as long as it's safe, meets code, let, let's make it better and, and not hammer down and, and make them fix. I know there are always, there's always a list of things, believe me, I know, but I think that there, that's where maybe we could, we could look at, you know, um, 
you know, excellent and perfect being the enemy of good. Anyway, thank you very much. I, I love this discussion. I want to see more um, housing on the future. Um, I also would like to know how many units, or maybe I missed that, are, how many units are out there in the county? Because I know that many exist that we would, we would not even um, believe are, are in place. And thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you, Council Member McKay. And I know that the need is 2,100, what I heard. I did not hear how many ag units are actually in the county. If anybody else on the, on the panel wants to type that in the chat. And looking for any other hands, I see Sean Horner is the only hand I see. Hopefully I'm not missing one. Yeah, I don't see any. Uh, just a quick follow-up on, uh, on the septic issue of the county. I hope you can relook at the rules around connecting to existing municipal sewer lines. You know, part of what we're seeing is for many years, mostly driven by open space and sprawl concerns, you know, put the people inside of various city limits has been the driving force in so many things. And, and, and a lot of side effects, right? Every time you make a rule for a good reason, there's a whole lot of side effects people miss. And so one of the rules still is there might be here in South County, a septic line running right past your property, but if your property is not in the city limits, thou shalt not connect. And getting a permit, I mean, building a septic system under current rules, is pretty much the rules are trying to keep us from building one at all, but <laughs> that's really the druthers of policymakers is no more septic systems. But so you're, you're kind of stuck, right? The policy imperative is no more septic systems, please build affordable housing uh, in our ag communities and but don't hook up to the sewer line even though there's capacity so I really hope that from a policy point of view that's one of the things you, you dig down on so to speak and and add some flexibility there it's it's a huge issue certainly in rural south county uh, areas thank you thank you John Consuelo thank you I had a question for Tim you mentioned that you use some hotels now to house folks and wondering if there may be an opportunity um, to partner with either the city of Kilroy or the city of Morgan Hill on looking um, as Project Home Key as an opportunity. Um, it is, you know, Project Home Key includes the acquisition of hotels um, primarily for those that are experiencing homelessness, but there may be an opportunity to look at that as a way of using the hotel, maybe multi-purpose in the way that we use the Ochoa Center, where during the, during the um, farming season, and I'm sorry that I'm not using the correct technical terms, during the farming season, it's used by um, ag workers or workers, as you described them. Um, and then in the off season, it's used for cold weather sheltering. Um, and just thinking if maybe there's an opportunity there. So um, yeah, just, so we actually go through labor contractors because of the um, the H two A program is so um, uh, complicated, really. So we actually um, most and most of the growers are the same. Very few of us have our own housing to address that particular H two A program. I know there's a large farmer in in Gilroy teaming up with a labor contractor to possibly get a a larger uh, housing unit together, but. So that being said, um, those were the people you'd connect to, and, and you, you know we could shoot it offline if you wanted. I can give you a list of the lo uh, local. Um, those are the ones that are actually renting the facilities. A lot of them team up with a, a larger grower for financing on it, um, and then it's paid back through um, you know whatever deal they make. But um, I would say the challenge for them is it's it's an extra management function, um, and the H two A workers come up. They're 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 ready to work. There's like, they're all there, really good attitudes. They're, they're super excited to be there. And it's just a, it's just a joy to, to work with them because they're just, they're, they're improving their lives, they're improving their family life. That being said, controlling another element of people that you don't know or don't know how the resources and stuff to do would probably take an extra step from whoever's going to tell those people to leave when it's time to leave. So, as a, as an, as a, I don't handle it personally. I actually pay the contractors part of the burden fee, but I could see from their point of view and say, "Listen, we're these guys are coming up. We're giving them food. We're giving them meals. They're happy to work. Everything's going. There's no monkey business. There's no, you know, there's nothing going on. It's you know, drugs and whatever." I'm not saying that the other people are doing that. I'm just saying it. 
they're not they're not equipped to handle any kind of um, eviction or problems they would mental illness or whatever would cause the other person to be there. Um, now, if there's a criteria that these people just need to get on their feet and they want to, there's an opportunity to, uh, you know, get some money back on that program and they are going to be there for five months and everyone knows the rules and it's seems I could see them actually teaming up with um, a group like yours. They would just be the extra. It's not their job is to, to, to work with the ag community and the ag workers and, and they specialize in that. For them to go outside of that, this probably would be challenging, but that's just a guess. I, and you, you can definitely get my contact, and I can hook you up with uh, some of the larger growers. But most of most of us use a labor contractor to to utilize the H two A program. I'm not seeing any other hands. I also just realized our planning commissioner, Laura Gonzalez Escoto, has joined us as well. Thank you, Laura. My apologies for missing you earlier. Okay, well, this has been really, really a great conversation. I appreciate all of you taking the time to be here with us this morning. Neither Consuelo nor I are all talk. We're going to continue to work on this issue. Just want to kind of summarize some of the points I heard this morning. Assembly member Robert Revis, this is a conversation that requires action that's long, that is a long time overdue. David Cox, um, there's a dignity and a right to providing housing for this community. Michael talking about the need for 2100 units um, that includes both seasonal and annual workers and um, appreciate the county planning department's efforts on this issue and Helena sharing with us the Pajaro Valley farm workers study and really highlighting the fact that you know this part of our community um, they are extremely low income workers like many other folks in various industries but we need to remember every time we're saying we need to build extremely low income units it is also for this part of our community, so we need to shy away from being resistant for homes that help support the people that feed us, literally. Um, lots of talk about issues of overcrowding, and I appreciate John's connection to talking about education and educational outcomes and, and making sure that um, future generations like myself and Consuelo have the opportunity to go to college and do other things if they so choose. If they'd like to stay in the ag industry, great. Um, maybe they'll own the farm one day as well, but, you know, if they want to go to college, they can certainly be encouraged to do that. So thank you all very, very much. Um, I'm going to type my name in the chat and my email and Consuelo and I and the rest of the team have your emails. We're going to continue the conversation. And with that, I will give you back the rest of your day. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you. We can do this. Thank yes. you. Yes. I like it. End on that.